Good afternoon, and welcome to the City of Fort Worth Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month program. My name is Elizabeth Van, and I serve on the city's Diversity and Inclusion Employee Committee representing the Police Department. The DNI Employee Committee leads the employee work group working under the leadership of the Diversity Inclusion Department that planned today's program. I'm excited to introduce our presenter, Dr. Dennis, who will share with us not only information about the Asian history and tradition of meditation and mindfulness, but also lead us through some exercises that I think we can all benefit from in the workplace. But before I do that, I want to invite the city's, um, the city's chief equity officer and director of the Diversity and Inclusion Department, Christina Brooks, to give us a few remarks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. You'll have to excuse my voice. I'm getting over a little cold, but I did want to take some time to introduce you to um, our program today and welcome you. So as you know, Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month is an annual celebration that recognizes the historical and cultural contributions of individuals and groups of Asian and Pacific Islander descent to the United States. The Asian population is growing at a faster percentage in North Texas than any other demographic. That's according to the U.S. Census data. In Tarrant County alone, 129,437 Asians were counted in the 2020 census, a 57% jump from 10 years earlier. At 1.5 million, Asians now make up 6% of the te total Texas population. Now, if you've attended these before, you know that I do some historical research um, for each one of our uh, months uh, where we are remembering and celebrating different cultures. And so in conducting this historical research on notable Fort Worth Asian residents and, and businesses, there was a name that rose to the top of the list. His name is Kenetaro Fujita. You may be familiar with what remains of his legacy, the James Fujita House. Originally uh, built in 1915 for Thomas and Annie James, the home was purchased four years later by Kenetaro Fujita. Fujita served as president of a Japanese cotton exporting firm the Gosho Company, incorporated in 1917 and dissolved just after the U.S. entry into World War II. And in 1936, after Fujita returned to Japan, he sold the home to the company. If you've been by there, out on College Avenue, you'll notice that there are features of the James Fujita house, which include the gamble roof, <coughs> front porch columns and balusters, um, but <clears throat> it was recorded as a te Texas historic landmark in 1986. But after Fujita left in 1936, it would be 37 years later when Fort Worth would once again recognize the important contribution of Asian culture with the opening of the Fort Worth Japanese Gardens in 1973. It is a traditional strolling garden with winding paths through landscapes and around ponds. The garden consists of 7.5 acres filled with cherry trees, Japanese maples, magnolias, bamboo, bridges, and ponds filled with koi fish. Except in the spring, there are few flowers blooming in the Japanese garden due to the Japanese practice of mono no awari. This translates into transient or bittersweet beauty, meaning that if the garden was always blooming, it would never be special. Mono no awari simply means the pathos of things, but it can also mean empathy for things. 
In Japanese culture, it is a crucial term. The word mano means things or things, while aware means feeling or sentiment. And the particle no denotes something an item has. As a result, mano no aware refers to pathos or profound feelings of things, as well as the strong emotions that objects can provoke or instill in us. It also refers to the bittersweet knowledge that everything is impermanent. It is the realization that everything in life is fleeting. The impermanence of youth, the dying of romance, the passing of seasons are not to be mourned, but to be embraced and cherished in their impermanence because that is where their beauty lies. Things would lose their ability to move us if there was no change. And the most valuable aspect of life is its unpredictability. For half a century now, the Japanese garden has been the oasis of serenity in the middle of a city, <coughs> a place for retreat, relaxation, and meditation. It's hard to believe the site had previously served as a gravel pit, a swatter's camp, and a dump. The Fort Worth Parks Department, later the Parks and Recreation, began its work in 1968 clearing the site, which the original architect, Al Kamatsu, once called a tremendous ecological disaster. But over time, they built ponds and waterfalls, shaped trails and paths, and selected plants that would lend Japanese beauty to a corner of Texas. Today, we hope to bring a little serenity right mm -hmm. here to city council chambers. So we invite you to participate <laughs> in, our, in our program and we hope that you enjoy it. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Elizabeth and Christina. And um, I just want to echo her comments about the Japanese gardens. They're, they're wonderful. Whenever um, a family member or a friend comes to visit me, I'm from the I'm from the north. I'm from Chicago and Wisconsin, uh, Illinois and Wisconsin, and a lot of my friends and family will come to escape the cold, and so I always take them to the gardens. Um, so so anyway, um, today what we'll do are some very short um, breathing and meditation practices, and I'll interweave those into uh, the program. I'll talk a little bit about the kind of historical background of Asian uh, religious and meditation traditions. Um, but I'll also talk about a group that we have uh, on the TCU campus called the Calm Studies Group. And I'll say more about them. And, and if you're interested in anything I have, uh, I say today, any of these practices, uh, and you want to learn more, you can just reach out to Veronica. She has my email, and I'm happy to <clears throat> uh, take any questions you might have. So we're going to start with a very simple practice. I'm combining a few things here. It'll be about three minutes. Um, ideally, you might just stop eating for a second, if that's OK. And so with all of these practices, um, you want to sit up straight, um, just have your back straight. You don't want to be tight, but you want to be upright. Um, and if, if it's comfortable for you, try to put your feet uh, flat on the floor. And then just take your hands, and you can put them in a comfortable position. When we start this practice, I'll invite you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. If not, you might just kind of look down and just squint a bit so you're, you're not distracted uh, by what's going on around you. And so we're going to start with a very simple uh, breathing practice. It's called, it goes by three numbers, four, 
seven, eight. And the four is a reference to the inhalation. And so you'll inhale, and in your mind, you'll count silently up to, uh, up to four. So inhale, four, hold for a count of seven, and then exhale for a count of eight. When you do the inhalation, see if you can breathe from the belly, from the diaphragm. And breathe in through your nose and really feel the air come and fill your lungs. So, And then you hold, counting to seven. And then you exhale, counting to eight. We'll do this two times. Okay, and this will, you cannot avoid this. This is a physiological response. You'll calm down, okay? After I do the second, my second, four, seven, eight, I'll wait for maybe 10 seconds, and I'll start speaking, and I'll lead you through just a, some very simple practices, and I just want to, <coughs> excuse me, I want, to, I want to mention that the practices I'm teaching you today, they're not coming out of a particular uh, religious tradition. Um, they're not Buddhist. They're not Hindu. These are secularized versions of these practices. And this is a very important point because I think it makes it more accessible to, to people who are, are not maybe interested in the religious part. I will be talking about that today, but the practices are not that way. Okay, so just to reiterate, uh, we'll do the four, seven, eight breathing practice. Just do it two times. Really try to breathe in uh, and just let that, whatever tension you're holding, it could be maybe you had a difficult conversation this morning or somebody cut you off in traffic, <laughs> whatever it is, just imagine breathing that out, okay? Any questions? OK, here we go. Two rounds of the four, seven, eight. Just keep your eyes closed, and I'll, I'll start speaking then. Here we go. Okay, I invite you to bring your attention to the sensation of your feet as they're resting against the floor. And just try to maintain your awareness on the sensation of your feet resting on the floor. If you're comfortable, you can imagine your feet touching Mother Earth, or maybe just the carpet underneath your feet, whatever is comfortable. This is a very simple exercise. We teach this a lot. And it's a technique that will help you slowly if you do it regularly. It will help you build your capacity to maintain your awareness in the present moment. Just watch your mind. Most of us, our minds go back and forth into the future, into the past, and we miss out on the present. If your mind has wandered away, don't worry about it. This is natural in meditation. We call this the monkey mind, the drunken monkey. Just acknowledge it. And in a very friendly way, just bring your mind and your attention, your awareness back 
to the sensation of your feet resting comfortably on the floor. We often call this a, an embodied practice, which simply means we're using a part of the body to build our capacity to stay in the present moment. This particular practice is often used in trauma therapy. It's been discovered, it's been discovered that this practice can help those who've experienced severe trauma, PTSD. So now we'll transition and we'll do one more short practice. And this is probably the most basic form of meditation. And it goes by different names. Um, I think the most common is breath awareness. And so I just invite you to bring your attention to your breath as it goes in and out, as you inhale and you exhale. Don't try to control your breath. Just breathe naturally. And just see if you can maintain your awareness on your breath as it goes in and out, in and out. The breath is often described as being the bridge between the mind and the body. The breath can bring us back to the present moment. So I, I won't speak for maybe 30 seconds. And during the silence, I invite you simply to follow your breath. And if, it, if your mind wanders away, just acknowledge it and in a friendly way, always in a friendly way, just bring it back to the breath. Here we go. Okay, and to, to wrap up this practice, what we'll do is we'll take uh, two deep breaths. And I invite you, as you take those deep breaths, and don't rush, as you take these breaths, just bring to mind uh, something that you're grateful for, this we call a gratitude practice. There's actually a lot of research that shows developing uh, a gratitude practice can, all, can have all kinds of positive um, effects on our minds, on our bodies, on our connections to others. And we'll wrap up today with a short uh, gratitude practice, which I'll explain later. So just to, just to recap, just take two deep breaths, and as you do so, just bring to mind something that you're grateful for. It can be a person, it can be an idea. Maybe it's a, a thing. Maybe it's your lunch today. Maybe it was particularly uh, tasty and you're grateful for it, or maybe it's a piece of clothing, whatever it might be. After your second exhalation, just go ahead and slowly open your eyes, and we'll move on. Here we go.
Well, I wanted to um, express my gratitude to you for inviting me here today. It's, I think I'm, I think I'm doing that. Sorry. Um, maybe I should stand up. Um, it's really, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, so thank you for inviting me. So let me just look at my notes real quick here. Okay. So I, I do want to say um, a few things about what we just did. I teach this, those practices we just did, I teach a lot. And the 478 is something I do with students. And like when I go to a program like this, but with students, I, I always say to them, if you remember nothing from what I say today, um, you know, with young people especially, there's just such a high level of distraction. In fact, it's, it's really causing a lot of issues with students' ability to pay attention. As you probably know, there have been some really alarming uh, studies and statistics that are coming out about the mental health of young people. There was a, a CDC report that came out in February of this year, and it gave a number of really alarming statistics about um, the mental health of, of teens who, who are then going into college. But things like depression, anxiety, vital ideation, just very serious stuff. And so I tell, I tell them, if you remember nothing else, remember this, this practice because it is really powerful for calming your system down. Many of my students have really debilitating anxiety. Um, some get panic attacks. And, and this, this 478 practice is really use, useful for that. Um, I've had lots of students who've talked about how much it's helped them. Um, with test anxiety, I had a student who had a fear of flying, and she got on a plane, and she could feel herself constricting. And so she did this practice, and it really, it really helped her. So, so anyway, please remember this practice. Next time you get really stressed, give it a try. I also recommend the gratitude practice. You can have a gratitude practice in many ways. You can keep a gratitude journal. You can express gratitude verbally. But there's, there's a researcher uh, out in the U University of California system, Robert Emmons, who studies this. And uh, the, the research is very clear that people who practice this regularly really have positive benefits. So. Um, so what I'd like to do is go through, I, I have a PowerPoint, and, and we'll go through this. I'm, I'm causing a lot of commotion. It's supposed to be calming. <laughs> and I'm giving you static. Uh, I apologize. Um, so I have some slides, and I'm going to go through those. And again, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand, um, or you can, um, you, you're welcome to contact me later, OK? So um, let me say just a little bit about myself. Um, you can see my name is Mark Dennis. I teach in the TCU Religion Department. I came to TCU in 2007. Uh, my background is in Buddhism. Uh, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. I was born in Chicago, but grew up in Madison. And um, I went uh, to the University of Wisconsin to study business finance. And I worked for a couple years in business. I was in a, working in a mutual fund in Boston and kind of had, I'm sure you all know, the, the midlife crisis. I had the midlife crisis, but much earlier was the quarter life crisis. <laughs> so. Uh, anyway, it's kind of a, a, a long story, but it led me to Japan and to study Zen Buddhism. So I went to Japan in 1987, and I lived there for almost five years. I love Japan. I consider myself a practitioner of Zen Buddhism. My research is in the Japanese language, and um, I, study, I study Buddhism. Um, my position at uh, TCU is 
East Asian religions, and so that includes Buddhism, but Taoism, Confucianism, and some other other uh, traditions. Um, so you can see that the topic is um, meditation and mindfulness in Asian uh, religious traditions. And so I'm going to start and uh, just talk a little bit about these different uh, Asian meditation traditions. Each of them is quite different. So we're going to start with a broad lens, and then we'll narrow it down to Buddhism, which is what I practice and also what I uh, study. And you can see I've listed some, not all, of the major um, religious traditions that come out of Asia that have a meditation or mindfulness component. So Buddhism, which I've been talking about, and I'll return to in just a minute. Hinduism, which is very broad. And I just included yoga because uh, yoga is generally quite well known in the United States. There's lots of yoga studios. Many of my students practice yoga, but but there's many other traditions within Hinduism. Uh, Taoism is one of the two one of the two uh, major traditions, religious traditions in China. The other being Confucianism, so Taoism, uh, and then the last two are maybe religions that you've never heard of or maybe you've just heard their names but don't know much about, and those are Jainism and Sikhism. Uh, Jainism goes back about 2,500 years uh, to the same time when the Buddha was alive. Uh, but Sikhism is much more recent. The founder of Sikhism uh, was uh, a guru, Nanak, and he lived uh, in the 1500s. Okay, so these are just a few of uh, the traditions. And then you can see this next slide is um, the Indian meditation tradition. So we're kind of narrowing it down. And one of the really interesting parts of these traditions, and my students always find this fascinating, you know, I teach at TCU, and you will not be surprised to know that many of my students are Christians. <laughs> it's the C in TCU. And so the worldview that is expressed or undergirds these uh, traditions is very different than Christianity or the monotheistic tradition, so Islam, Christianity, Judaism. And it's often described using these, these four key concepts. And so the first concept is, a, these are Sanskrit words, and the first one is samsara. And samsara simply means something that goes around in a, in a circle. It has these cycles. And the belief in all of the Indian religious traditions that I listed is that there's these, these, this circular pattern that governs the cosmos. But then you can, you can narrow that down and look at it within the individual life cycle. And as you may know, these, these traditions believe that we're born, we live in the world, we die, and then we come back into the world. This is, this is the cycle of samsara. Um, the next idea, and this is one that my students usually have heard of, is karma. Uh, karma, I think, is a simple idea. I ask my students what you know about karma, and most of them will say, what goes around comes around. <laughs> and that's actually a very good definition. Karma, is, it's very simple on its you know, when you look at it that way, it's it's easy to understand. However, uh, it gets really interesting when you kind of dig into it and talk about how different uh, these different traditions understand karma. And I'll just give you one example. Um, in Buddhism, uh, the Buddhists generally believe that it's the intention behind an act. What did you intend? So. If I am walking along and I step on a bug, but it's because I didn't see the bug, that's a very different uh, kind of karmic uh, act than if I see a bug and I deliberately step on it. That's just a, a simple example. But the other traditions, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, they all have their own kind of interpretation of that. 
The next term is atma, uh, which is generally translated self, sometimes soul. Uh, you've probably heard of Gandhi, uh, a figure who f I'm fascinated with. I do a big section in one of my courses, uh, World Religions, on Indian independence, and Gandhi is one of the main figures. But Gandhi is often referred to as the Mahatma. Maha in Sanskrit means great or big, and you put two words together, those two words together, self or soul, and maha, great, and you get the great soul. So Gandhi is known as the Mahatma. And if somebody says in India, the Mahatma, everybody knows <laughs> it's Gandhi. Uh, and then the last one is uh, moksha. And I love this word because it sounds like mocha, and students relate to that. And moksha is, is actually, a, it comes from a Sanskrit verb, much, M-U-C, which means to be free or to liberate. Um, it is um, an important part of traditional yoga, this idea that you do not just the physical, the asanas, the physical practices, but there's an ethical component, there's breathing, there's meditation, uh, there's diet. And all of those are meant to lead you to this state of liberation. And it's liberation or freedom from this cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. That is the basic worldview of the, each of those traditions that come out of India. Um, when you start to look at how they understand karma and moksha, um, then it gets a little more complicated. In fact, well, Buddhists, Buddhists sometimes use the word moksha. More commonly, they use the word nirvana, which I'm, I imagine is a word you're familiar with. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on here um, and talk about meditation and mindfulness in Buddhism. And this is, this is meant to just introduce you to kind of the basic ideas of Buddhism and um, help you understand why many Buddhists, now some Buddhists don't do much meditation, but many do, especially in the tradition I come out of, the Zen Buddhists. This is meant to help you understand why they, why they do this. And so the first key concept is the basic statement about the nature of this world, that what we're inhabiting here. And this is the teaching that the Buddha gave to his disciples um, when he started teaching some 2,500 years ago. There's a lot of debate about when exactly he lived. He was active in what is the northeastern part of India. <clears throat> But anyway, these, these, these truths are just a basic statement about reality. And the first one is life in the world is characterized by dukkha, which is often translated as suffering, which is kind of an unfortunate translation. What it really means is um, dissatisfaction or dis-ease with things in the world. We want something, but... I think as um, Christina was saying when she was talking about the gardens, everything is, is constantly uh, changing. And so if we cling to something, whatever it is we cling to, you know, it can be we want to be famous or um, we want to be rich or whatever a person, uh, those things will inevitably change. And so there's this suffering or dukkha that is caused by that. Um, the second truth is uh, this dukkha, uh, this suffering is caused by craving, literally thirst. We want stuff. When I was young, I wanted to be rich. I tell my students this. That's why I got into business. I wanted to be rich, rich, rich. That's a, that's a very common, obvious kind of <clears throat> craving. The third truth is if you remove craving, you will remove suffering. And then the fourth one is the path, the Eightfold Path. And that path uh, has eight parts. I'm not going to list those, but it has three main sections. One is ethics. You see this in all religious traditions, whether it's Christianity or Hinduism or Buddhism. Then what's called wisdom. But then the third part, which is what we're most interested in, is uh, mental cultivation. Mental cultivation is referring to things like meditation and mindfulness. 
the belief in uh, uh, Buddhism is that if we can change our minds, if we can reorient our consciousness stream, we can change how we exist in the world, how we feel about ourselves, how we relate to others. Um, and there's the one of the related concepts is interdependence, our connection to others. When when we slowly are able to reduce our sense of being separate, isolated selves, then the, the logical implication is that we connect. We connect to others, and this opens up a really uh, interesting, can open up an interesting space in our lives. Um, and then, as I said before, uh, nirvana is the ultimate goal of, of Buddhism, and that's release liberation from this cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. <clears throat> Sorry, my, I'm, my voice is, is, is a, little, a little crackly today. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about my, my experience. Um, I mentioned I had this quarter-life crisis. This was 1987. It was a long time ago. <laughs> and I had some friends uh, working in the mutual fund who'd been to Japan, and they said, they had, thank you. They had, uh, they studied Eastern religions. It was all the same. It was, you know, all this stuff that I've just talked about. And so I was, I, I mean, I'd say it was a quarter life crisis. It was serious. It was really destabilizing. I had imagined myself in one way. All of a sudden that was taken away from me. Um, and so I started doing meditation and it just calmed me down. And uh, it was wonderful. So I've been, I've been doing it, what is that, 35, 36 years every day. Maybe once a year I'll miss a day, but it's very rare. Um, so in 1987, I went to Japan. I just got on a plane and flew to Tokyo. I met a guy on the plane. He was an American guy who'd been there. And he, I said, I don't know where I'm going. And he said, well, you can tie along with me. And we, we got on a train. Fortunately, we got there on a Sunday, and it wasn't too crowded. And we went to a place called Shinjuku Station. It may sound familiar to some of you because it was in downtown Fort Worth, the Shin, uh, Shinju, or over on Magnolia, Shinjuku Station, a wonderful restaurant. Uh, it's, a, it's full of neon, and it's great. It's just a very exciting place. Anyway. I ended up living in Japan for five years, doing a lot of Zen meditation retreats, uh, and they were they were wonderful. It was some were just a weekend, some were for about a week, and it was just. So anyway, I, I spent about five years there, and during that time, I was able to travel in Asia. I went to places like China, Indonesia, Singapore, but also India. Um, I went a couple times to India, and I just am fascinated by India and Japan. Um, and in 1992, I decided to move to India, and I lived on a Hindu ashram, not a Buddhist one, a Hindu ashram, for two and a half years. And I was a gardener. It was wonderful. It was very simple. They, they had electricity, but you had to pump your water. You had to wash your clothes by hand. And I tell my students this, they just can't imagine. They just can't imagine. No newspaper. But it was wonderful. Uh, so I spent about eight years overseas, um, came back, and I went through the PhD program in Buddhist studies at the University of Wisconsin and uh, eventually ended up at TCU. So I, I want to kind of move through this because um, I, I want to be mindful of our time. And I do want to end with a practice. Um, <clears throat> so you can see this next slide is the mindfulness movement in the West. And I've just included two photos. So mindfulness, am I doing that? And if so. So. Um, I don't know if this one's working. It is? OK. Um, so mindfulness is one of those mental cultivation practices that's common in Buddhism. So meditation and mindfulness. And they're, Buddhists will say they're different. They're often put together. They're conflated in, in the United States. But 
but mindfulness is more paying attention. Like right now I'm speaking, and maybe you're listening, but then your mind, what we call the monkey mind, <laughs> it intervenes. And all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, it's going to be 1 o'clock, I've got a meeting, or whatever, whatever it might be. And so mindfulness is learning slowly. It's painfully slow to maintain your awareness. Like that exercise we did with our feet on the floor. It's just teaching you to maintain your awareness. And it's like anything. If you've never lifted a weight or, you know, gone running, it's, it's very hard. And... Um, this whole last semester, I was, <laughs> I was technologically cursed in my class. I had all these problems, which I don't normally have, and I can see it's followed me. Into <laughs> it's followed me here. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, that's, that's what mindfulness is. And there's a mindfulness movement, a boom, a craze in the United States and elsewhere. And there's, there's, two, there's many figures, but these are the two uh, I, I think of uh, most commonly. One is Thich Nhat Hanh. I'm a huge fan of Thich Nhat Hanh. He died in January of 2022. He was a wonderful human being. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, he, he saw the horrors of the Vietnam War uh, he and the, he, he's a Zen monk. His, uh, his tradition stayed neutral in the war, and um, many of his fellow monks and nuns and children under his care uh, were killed um, in the violence, and he saw this. And so he created a movement, I would consider myself to be part of this, called Socially Engaged Buddhism, which simply means... Um, to be mindful of what's going on in the world, in our society, to all the kinds of suffering that exist. You might think of our society, things like systemic racism, food insecurity, poverty, uh, climate, uh, climate change, and many, many others. And so his basic message was we, we look at that, we don't turn away from the suffering. If you see a homeless person, you don't turn away from it. And then you do whatever you can uh, to reduce that suffering. Um, and that's, that's his message. And so he's one of the key figures known for the mindfulness movement. The other is John Kabat-Zinn, a very different person, a scientist. Um, and he, he um, is probably the figure best known for creating the mindfulness movement in the West, especially the secularized version. And his experience was he was working with women with breast cancer at a hospital in Amherst, Massachusetts. And he started teaching them these practices. Not as a, it's not a cure for cancer. But what it can do is help the women who are experiencing physical pain, anxiety, all sleep issues. He discovered it could be a very powerful way to help them reorient their minds towards what they were experiencing. And he created a program that has, is very popular and really well studied. Um, it's called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. Oftentimes, it's just MBSR. Um, he's, he's one of the really important figures in the mindfulness. Mo Oops, what did I do? What did I do? Oh, no, no. I told you I'm cursed. Okay. Um, so I, I want to just take a few more minutes because I do want to do one more practice. I'd hope to do a few more, but as a typical academic, I love to hear my own voice. Um, so I've written some the names of some really great books up here. If you're if you're interested in mindfulness, all of them are really accessible. Um, the first is the Miracle of Mindfulness. That's by Thich Nhat Hanh, the first figure I talked about. It was it was written as a letter to uh, one of his followers who was experiencing the incredible violence 
the Vietnam War and how do you how do you practice these kinds of things when you see people around you dying? It's a wonderful book. I, I teach a course in Buddhism and I use it often. Um, the next book is by John Kabat-Zinn, The Second Figure. He's written two books and both of them have great titles. Wherever you go, there you are, meaning you can, you can try to get away from yourself. You can go to another place. You can, you know, drink alcohol or whatever it is, but there, you're still there. And the other, the other one, the other title is Full Catastrophe Living. <laughs> I love that title. It's, it's like most of us live. It's a wonderful, both of his books are wonderful. Um, the next one is called The Mindful 20-something. This is written by uh, Holly Rogers, who's a medical doctor. She's a practicing psychiatrist. She teaches at Duke University. She works in the counseling center. I, I teach this every semester, this book. It's wonderful. It is, it's very, it's cheap. It's about $10. It's, a, it's written in very accessible language. She includes science notes that are easy to understand. She includes practices and has lots of, of wisdom. Uh, and then the final one is called 10% Happier. And um, that is by... Uh, former ABC News journalist Dan Harris, I think some of you will recognize his name and probably know who he is, uh, but he, he, was, he was very skeptical of the benefits of mindfulness and meditation. He, had a, he f kind of freaked out while he was on the national news and he couldn't breathe and he couldn't speak. And so it was kind of a long story, but that led him to meditation. And so he's become... You know, like the ex-smoker who's really anti-smoking, he's become <laughs> he's become like that. He and he's got a great platform. He's he's got a uh, the book and a podcast called Ten Percent Happier, which I can't recommend enough. He's really good at what at interviewing people. He doesn't talk too much. Um, so let me let me just say uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through all these slides, but we have a group on campus, uh, the TCU campus, called Calm Studies, and Calm is an acronym. It means compassionate awareness and living mindfully. Our group started as a meditation and mindfulness group in 2012. If you're interested in any of this, please write to Veronica, and I'll put you on our mailing list. We're very active. We have all kinds of, a lot of the stuff is virtual uh, because of, you know, the pandemic, which I think we're coming out of. Uh, but anyway, I'll just show you these slides, and then I, I'll do a short practice with you. It's a wonderful practice. It's the compassion practice. And here's, here's a, um, this is the image that appears on our website, and it talks about kind of our pillars, belonging, wisdom, compassion, and flourishing. Uh, that's our, um, you can see, we just met yesterday with this group. Uh, this is our advisory uh, committee. They're just wonderful, wonderful group. Uh, these are our current and former uh, student leaders. And uh, then the last, the last thing is we're part of a group that's called the Flourishing Academic Network that has these wonderful institutions like Brown University, Stanford, but TCU is also part of it. Um, and uh, here's what we're hoping to do. We eventually would like to build a center and have a room like this one. <laughs> but that, as you know, that takes a lot of money, which we, which we don't have. So I put questions, but I'd really like to do one more practice with you. And then um, I'm happy to take any any questions. I'll, I'll stay, and if, if you want to uh, ask me anything, I'd be happy to take take your question. So um, <clears throat> just go ahead and <clears throat> sit up straight like we did before and just put your feet flat on the floor, uh, back straight, hands resting in a comfortable position. We'll start with one deep breath and then I'll explain this exercise and then we'll do a just a abbreviated version of it. Okay? So let's take one deep breath, just like we did before. Breathe in through the nose. Start from the belly. Fill the lungs. Here we go. So 
So this practice um, is often called the metta. Metta is spelled M-E-T-T-A. Metta is translated usually as loving kindness, but sometimes as compassion. Um, There's all kinds of ways that you can think of this Sanskrit word. Um, And so the, the basic practice is that we will bring into our minds particular people or groups of people, and I will say out loud um, a set of short phrases, and they are, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. And so as you imagine this person um, or group of people, uh, you, I'll say it out loud, that, those phrases, and then just repeat them silently to yourself as you imagine this person. And uh, we always start with ourselves because many of us uh, engage in negative uh, self-talk. And this can be really destructive. And so an important part of this practice is to learn to look at ourselves and to talk talk to ourselves in a different way. And so I invite you to bring an image of yourself, of your own face, into your awareness. Um, You might imagine looking at yourself in the mirror this morning as you're getting ready to come to work, maybe in a photograph or a reflection in a body of water, whatever, whatever is comfortable for you. And so with that image of yourself uh, before you, please repeat the following phrases. May you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. May you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. Now please draw into your awareness somebody you love dearly, somebody you're very close to, a person who you you know, you know deep down has your best interest at heart, somebody who's always been there for you. This could be a parent, a grandparent, maybe an aunt, an uncle, a sibling, or other family member. It could be your romantic partner, maybe your best friend. It could even be your your pet. And so with their face before you, please tell them, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. May you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. Now please draw into your awareness somebody, somebody who you know uh, quite well, but you also know is struggling, is suffering uh, acutely, and this could be for all kinds of reasons. Maybe it's a serious illness. Maybe it's a uh, a bad, a toxic uh, relationship, uh, a financial or um, food insecurity. All kinds of all kinds of issues could cause this, and so. Just bring an image of that person into your mind's eye and tell them, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. May you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. And now we'll uh, do the part that often people find a bit a bit difficult, and I, I want to explain why we're doing this. So I'm going to invite you to bring into your awareness somebody, somebody you find to be difficult, a person maybe who annoys you. This could be because of a particular incident, maybe maybe today. Uh, but it could also be because of a pattern of behavior uh, or speech. And we do this for a couple of reasons. One is because we simply do not know 
what is causing uh, a person to act in this way that we find uh, to be annoying or difficult or offensive. Um, we, don't, we don't know what is uh, behind that. But the other thing is, um, many of us, and I would say this is true of me, we can have these kinds of negative experiences and then get stuck in this negative cycle of this loop of, of toxicity. And the research shows that if we do this practice regularly, and for it takes some time, but slowly, slowly, those ruts get more and uh, get less deep. They're more shallow. So we spend less time in that, that negative loop. And so I invite you to bring into your awareness the image of a person who has annoyed you. And please repeat the following phrases. May you be well. May you be happy. May you be at peace. May you be well. May you be happy. May you be at peace. And now, let's bring into our awareness our group that's here today, that's come in the middle of the day to learn a little bit about Asian religious traditions, their meditation and mindfulness practices. And so, in whatever way is comfortable for you, just bring our entire group into your awareness and please tell us, may you be well, May you be happy, may you be at peace. May you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. And then the last group uh, is what uh, Buddhists would call sentient beings, all beings, uh, humans and non-human animals, all the bugs and critters that exist in our world, but other elements of the natural world, rivers, plants, trees, fruits, vegetables, mountains, all of it. Just bring it into your awareness in whatever way is comfortable for you. And please tell us, may you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. May you be well, may you be happy, may you be at peace. And now, to wrap up this practice, we'll do what we did before when we started. And that is just to take two deep breaths. And just bring to mind something that you're grateful for, or maybe something different uh, from the first time. And after your second exhalation, uh, go ahead and, and slowly open your eyes, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Sorry about all the crackling. <laughs> That's a bit distracting. Uh, but I, I really appreciate uh, your coming today. And I'll stick around if anybody has any, any questions or comments. If you want to get on our mailing list, I'd be happy. I'd be happy to help you. I think Elizabeth has some final words. So um, that was a great presentation. Thank you. I think we all learned something new um, that we didn't know before and are hopefully feeling less stressed after the mindfulness exercises that Dennis led us through. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. And thank you all of the employee who helped plan today's program and to our audiences for making the time today to help us celebrate Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. 
And I also want to acknowledge that this program would not be possible without the support of our city's leadership and diversity and inclusion department and its effort to promote the quality of life in Fort Worth and um, that includes opportunity and access for all. So everyone be sure to read the Brown app to learn about opportunities and help plan and attend future programs. Thank you.